Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 30th of August, 2022. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So just a heads up that there will be no refuel uh, tomorrow, tomorrow being Wednesday uh, and Friday. It is my fiance's 30th birthday on Thursday, so we're going to be doing some stuff to celebrate. So I unfortunately won't have the time to do the refuel on Wednesday or Friday. So uh, I will do a refuel on Thursday, but then a Monday Monday's refuel will cover Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, well, technically it'll cover like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So yeah, look forward to a possibly or probably extended refuel on Monday. Uh, but yeah, just keep in mind there won't be one on Wednesday or Friday, but there will be on Thursday. Anyway, we have the official announcement from, uh, I guess, like the Ethereum Foundation Twitter account about the mainnet merge. Now, obviously, uh, this came out about a week ago, but this was shared by the Ethereum Foundation Twitter account just today. And uh, it's got a few things in here that I think I have uh, I haven't covered yet. So uh, I think I've covered it, but just worth kind of like reminding people. Uh, the Bellatrix upgrade, which is for uh, the beacon chain for the consensus layer is scheduled for September 6th. Now, this is not the merge. I've seen some people get confused about this and think that this Bellatrix upgrade is the merge. It's a separate upgrade or separate hard fork for the beacon chain in order to get it ready for the merge, which is obviously happening around September 15th. Uh, the second thing is timing. So I just said, you know, the merge is happening around September 15th. That is the time that's been thrown around. But there is a kind of like wide range it can happen between. And you can see here the... Official post gives the range between the 10th and the 20th of September. Uh, we don't actually know the exact date simply because of the fact that it's based on TTD and not block time. Two of the websites that uh, that you can use to track the merge, uh, sorry, the merge timing is bordel.wtf, which you guys are probably familiar with. I've talked about it a bunch here. This is saying that the merge is scheduled to happen on sept uh, September 15th at around 2.40 uh, a.m. Uh, UTC uh, and, uh, sorry, between 2.40 a.m. UTC and 12 uh, 23 p.m. UTC. But then there's this other website called 797.io slash the merge, which is actually saying that it's going to occur on this, uh, September 14th at 1.43 p.m. UTC. Now, why the discrepancy? Well, because of TTD, it's based on hash rate and obviously estimating out uh, based on hash rate is, is is not going to give us a precise answer. And you can see here that actually the Ethereum hash rate went up uh, over the last, I guess, couple of days. And this might account for that, uh, I guess, like acceleration towards that TTD and it happening on September 14th, or at least kind of like estimated to happen on September 14th instead of uh, 15th. And I mean, this is kind of like a really noisy chart, but the hash rate did, did go up, right? And I mean, this is not, uh, this, I, I don't suspect that this is new miners coming online or anything like that. It's probably miners switching off other networks coming back to Ethereum. I saw that the ETC, Ethereum Classic Hash Rate, actually doubled. Uh, and I guess that's just miners trying to kind of go to that network because the, the price went up a little bit of ETC and kind of uh, get, get some profits there. But if the price goes down, then it becomes more profitable to mine Ethereum then they just go back to Ethereum, right? So the profitability of, of mining is obviously obviously varies from, from day to day, basically. Uh, and that's why you see this this variation uh, in, in hash rate. So I think this would explain the reason why it's sped up a bit here. And if more hash rate joins, it will speed it up even more. And that's why it's very, very hard to, to estimate exactly when it's going to happen because hash rate can drop off as well, which would push it out. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we've got a TDD set. The hash rate shouldn't vary too much. It should happen around September 15th. Uh, but don't be surprised if it happens, you know, a few days later or a few days earlier. It's just par for the course with this sort of stuff. I mean, I don't think we're going to get in a situation where it doesn't happen for a while because all these miners have dropped off and we've pushed out to October or something. I don't foresee that happening, but there definitely will be variation based on on this, the kind of like hash rate kind of coming and leaving as it normally does uh, and just depending on kind of what's more profitable. I mean, if ETC, for example, was to double in price in the next week, well, you would expect a lot of hash rate to leave Ethereum and go to the Ethereum Classic chain to level it out in terms of profitability. Uh, but if ETC was to fall by 50% over the next week or something, then you would expect hash rate to come to Ethereum. So it, as I said, it's hard to kind of gauge this because of the fact that hash rate is notoriously volatile. Uh, but that's why there is a discrepancy between Bordell and this other website, 797. Just wanted to point that out there because I saw some people on Twitter confused about it today. So uh, yeah, I mean, as we get closer to the merge, it'll be easier to estimate this stuff. Uh, uh, well, as we get closer to TTD, I should say. But yeah, I mean, we're still a couple of weeks out here, so it's difficult to get a very accurate uh, reading, but it's still expected around September 15th there. 
All right, so Prismatic Labs has published a blog post called Everything Node Operators Need to Prepare for the Ethereum Merge. So if you are a solo staker, node operator, whatever you want to call yourselves, you should definitely give this a read just to make sure that you are ready for the merge. I've talked about the merge readiness checklist before. I've talked about some of the things that you are required to do, such as making sure you're running a local execution execution layer client, making sure your JWT token uh, is, is set, your fee recipient is set, and uh, I guess like optionally making sure you have an MEV boost uh, um, a sidecar running along your, alongside your validators because if you want to capture MEV, that's the way to do so. But yeah, you can go check out this uh, blog post from Prismatic Labs here, specifically for Prism, obviously, uh, just to make sure that you haven't missed anything. Um, and you can also check out the merge readiness checklist as I've talked about before. All right, so the EF ecosystem support program shared today about the uh, merge data challenge, which I talked about, uh, I believe a few days ago, which is offering up to $30,000 in prizes for data visualizations, analysis, and new tools to, uh, I guess, like communicate the mountain of data the merge will produce. So you can get all the details from this blog post on the merge data challenge. And if you are a data wizard, maybe you have uh, have been making doing analytics dashboards, or maybe you've been playing around with Nansen, you should definitely have a go at this. I mean, as I said, there are prizes up to US thirty thousand uh, dollars USD here, and you know that's more money for ETH, right? So you should definitely have uh, give it a go if you are used to kind of making visualizations and working with Ethereum data, of course. Uh, and if you do, if you do make these things, feel free to share them in the Daily Gray Discord channel. I always love checking out new Dune Analytics dashboards. Hill Dobby actually shares his from time to time, which I really appreciate. I've I shouted him out on the refill a bunch of times because he makes great dashboards. But yeah, feel free to always jump in there and share them with me and with the community. I always love seeing that sorts of stuff. I, I love checking out the data. I mean, uh, I guess like long time Daily Gray uh, watchers will know that I used to do a data series called the Daily Gray Data Pump. And I don't think I've done an episode of that for quite a while now. Uh, and also the AMA series, man, I've been lazy there, but uh, <laughs> maybe I, I, I'll get back to that soon. But yeah, if you if you do have any dashboards you want to share with us, definitely jump in the dis into the Discord and share it. But have a go at this data challenge because the prizes are very juicy. All right, so there's been a lot of chatter recently, and I've talked about it a lot too, about how layer twos are, I guess, sapping activity away from layer one, right? And that's what we want to see. We want to see users migrating from layer one to layer two, because at the end of the day, these low gas prices are not going to last forever. I fully expect layer one gas prices to probably not go back to up to like hundreds of Gwei, but probably, you know, 40, 50 Gwei. Uh, I, I fully expect those average gas prices to come back once the uh, the bull market comes back, you know, in earnest. And because of that, you want to be on layer twos before that happens. So you don't have to pay the, I guess, extra fees to onboard into layer twos. Uh, but I think more people are waking up to this now. And you can see here in this tweet shared, uh, on 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 uh, of a picture of Op optimism and arbitrage transactions over the last thirty days, uh, they've been averaging around three hundred thousand per day, which is twenty five percent of the Ethereum mainnet, which is awesome to see. Now there is a bit of nuance here that I want to talk about. The Ethereum mainnet, and this all kind of like pisses me off a lot when the Alt L one uh, people do this. The Ethereum mainnet can only process a certain number of transactions based on the gas limit. So. As you guys know, like different types of transactions use different amounts of gas and the Ethereum gas limit is, uh, you know, Ethereum has a certain gas limit that can go up and down. Uh, and because of that, essentially, there's only so many transactions we can fit into each block due to that gas limit. And, and then obviously each day, uh, which is the accumulation of, the, of all those blocks. Uh, so essentially Ethereum is, is capped. Like it can't go any higher than that. Uh, and that's why fees go up because we've reached the limit and fees will go up to, because people outbid each other to try, to try and get into a block. Now, if all the transactions were, I mean, I think the average transactions for Ethereum is like 1.2, 1.3 million a day, but that's all different types of transactions. That's, you know, AMM swaps, that's money market stuff, that's NFTs, that's simple ETH transfers. But if all the transactions were just simple ETH transfers, which only cost 21,000 gas, it's actually the cheapest thing you can do on Ethereum, then uh, we would have more than 1.3 million. We would have a lot more than that. But that's not the way the Ethereum network works. That's not the way any smart contract chain that has a fee market would logically work. So when comparing transactions 
per day from Ethereum mainnet to these layer twos, you really do need to realize that these layer twos are inherently going to be much more scalable than Ethereum layer one. Uh, and these other L1s uh, are inherently going to be able to process more transactions than Ethereum layer one, because most of the time, or pretty much all the time, they trade off decentralization for more scalability, right? They they up the their version of their gas limit and they can process more transactions per day because of that. That's why I've always said that these kind of metrics are naive to take them on just face value. You need to take the metrics all together. And I fee revenue is obviously one of my favorite metrics, but I think that that's going to prove to be a weak metrics for layer twos post proto dank sharding because of the fact that it's going to be so, so cheap for layer twos to put their call data on layer one that uh, their transactions are going to fall dramatically. And we're probably going to see an uptick in spam because of that or an uptick in, in, in junk transactions, I guess you could call them because of that. So you have to take it all uh, as kind of like a, as a collective uh, and measure users and a number of users in different ways. In saying that, right now, while layer twos are still relatively, you know, expensive, they're, they're not the cheapest they can be. They're not the most expensive they can be. They're kind of like in the middle. I think the per day transaction counts is still very accurate. So 300,000 per day, which is 25% of Ethereum for Optimism and Arbitrum, both the networks is really, really cool. I love seeing that. Um, sorry, this is c combined, not, uh, not, not, not each of these networks are doing this, this is combined. Uh, and obviously we have Arbitrum Odyssey going, uh, sorry, Arbitrum Nitro going live tomorrow, as you can see, Stephen Goldfeder uh, reminding us here, which is going to increase the capacity of Arbitrum by about 10x, I believe. So they're going to, uh, to restart Odyssey and I expect Arbitrum transactions just to shoot up again. Optimism still has the Optimism Summer that they're running with all the token incentives. Uh, and you know, both ecosystems are building out very nicely here. I, as I said, I think while transactions are still uh, e e relatively expensive due to that uh, relatively expensive call data, uh, call data cost, it means that we, we can kind of look at this and, and have relative confidence that it's not junk or spam transactions because it would cost too much to do that. So I'm looking forward to seeing this grow to millions of transactions per day on these on these kind of like layer two networks. It shows that there is still growth happening, that looking at layer one Ethereum is just really not the way to go anymore. And, uh, I, and I, speaking of data, as I was speaking about before, I think that a lot of the dashboards that I've seen for growth are focused on only Ethereum layer one, which just seems nonsensical to me. They should be focused on Ethereum layer one and the layer twos, because at the end of the day, the layer twos are an extension of Ethereum layer one. They count towards Ethereum's activity. So we should be measuring them uh, in aggregate. In saying that, we should also be more nuanced about it and look at what share of the layer one Ethereum network layer twos are taking up. Because as that continues to grow, we can see like the migration uh, happen in real time as well. But all in all, the migration is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take you know a, a certain period of time. There are going to be, uh, I guess, like non-true layer twos, such as Arbitrum Nova, for example, and Immutable X. Which I mean, if you want to call a true layer two a roll up, Immutable X and Arbitrum Nova uh, are not roll ups. Uh, the Polygon POS chain obviously is not a a roll up. Um, but those things kind of like work to to scale Ethereum as well and and kind of like work to scale uh, the, the user base because Arbitrum Nova is targeting more of those social uh, gaming applications. Uh, there is Immutable X obviously targeting NFT and gaming. Polygon POS Chain does a bit of everything. I think they're, they're very much focused on NFTs and, and gaming, but they've also got a vibrant DeFi ecosystem. Uh, but as I said, they're not a, a roll up or, or a layer two or anything like that. Uh, but that can easily, you know, eventually be ported over to a ZKVM or something once the technology is there. So, it's just a lot more nuanced than looking at Ethereum layer one these days. And I just really hate when people look at Ethereum layer one and be like, hey, you know, Ethereum layer one transactions aren't growing, it's stagnant. It's like, well, because it can't, like unless we raise the gas limit, there, there, just, it, there can't be an increase in transactions per day on Ethereum. That's why looking at fear revenue makes sense for Ethereum layer one, makes the most sense. If fear revenue is up, it means there's more demand to use the network. If fear revenue is down, down, it means there's less demand to use the network. But at the end of the day, the Ethereum network has been at capacity for years now. Um, even at the lowest gas prices, it's still at capacity. That's because Ethereum layer one is still a vibrant ecosystem. Lots of people still use it, whether the gas prices are, are, are low or high. Uh, and but, but in saying that, people are using these layer twos as well. So it's all just kind of like coming together as one big ecosystem. And we need to look at all the metrics across that to get a nice snapshot of what Ethereum activity looks like going forward. Uh, but yeah, leaving it at that for now. As I mentioned, Arbitrum Nitro goes live tomorrow. Uh, and uh, Stephen Goldfeder here put out a tweet. To use an airplane analogy, we've 
we've built a brand new engine to power L2. That's pretty cool, but only half the story. The Arbitrum 1 airplane is already in flight. Tomorrow we're swapping the engine mid-air. I mean, in terms of significance, I don't, okay, I don't think the Albatrum Nitro is as significant as the Ethereum Merge, obviously, but if you take it as like a, a vacuum, Nitro is to Albatrum 1 what the Merge is to Ethereum. Like, it's that big of an upgrade, I think. So I'm obviously very much looking forward to using Albatrum straight after Nitro is live on the network uh, because I want to experience all... All the, all, all the improvements that have come to the network. Uh, I mean, Arbitrum's already great. Like I use I use a bunch of the different layer twos. I, I use, I mean, I, I do use Arbitrum and Optimism a lot because they have the the, the, the um the most bustling ecosystems, <clears throat> but I use all of them. I like to test them out, see what, see what they got going for them, see what the UX is like. I mean, Arbitrum one's already great. Like it's fast. Uh, the transactions aren't, you know, aren't like layer one expensive. They're, I mean, it's relative between Arbitrum and Optimism, but the costs are going to come down. The scalability is going to go up and, uh, uh, and, and I believe the security is going to go up as well, which is very, very cool. So looking forward to that happening tomorrow. As I said before, there's no refuel tomorrow. So I'll be reporting on this on, on Thursday. So we'll, hopefully it is a successful migration there. All right. So speaking of Polygon, they, I think this was already announced that they were powering uh, Facebook and Instagram's new NFT integration. Uh, but this is now live on uh, on, Inst on on Facebook and Instagram. So you can connect your wallet uh, to either app and start sharing your NFTs today. As Meta, which is Facebook and Instagram's parent company, says here. Now, I believe that the interface for this. I saw some screenshots of this. Uh, when you connect your wallet, it's, it's kind of like, it just looks like a, a normal Web3 app. Uh, where is it? Uh, uh, no, nah, that's not a screenshot. Yeah, I saw a screenshot before of being able to select a bunch of different wallets. There was like Wallet Connect in there, MetaMask. I can't remember what other wallets are in there, but that was really cool to see. Uh, Mahalo from, from Polygon here, uh, basically, you know, he said it's awesome to see Polygon powering this, even more so because along the way, we understood that Meta is now aligned with the core Web3 values, and we learned about their exciting plans for, for the future here. So if you want to read the full press release, you can. It'll be linked in the YouTube description below. But I think this is a pretty big deal, guys. Like, we always talk about adoption and getting these big existing Web2 companies to integrate with the Ethereum I guess chain and with uh, not with the well, we always with the Ethereum chain, but with crypto more generally, uh, and we want them using things that are part of the Ethereum family. So I'm very glad that they went and and chose Poly the Polygon POS chain as the first kind of like chain that they're, that they're using here because there's a vibrant user base on there, uh, and I think that it's you know obviously those low fees there as well uh, make it work uh, very well too. So great to see that. Oh, and here we go. There's actually a list here of the wallets that are supported. So they're supporting Rainbow, uh, MetaMask, Trust Wallet, Coinbase. Well, and and Dapper Wallet, uh, which uh, and, and Ethereum, Polygon, and Flow are the supported blockchains, uh, which is which is cool to see. So I think uh, yeah, this announcement today is about them going live on on Polygon, and that's what Mahalo was was highlighting here. Uh, but yeah, great to see that they're getting involved. I know people have different opinions of Facebook and Instagram. I mean, I'm not going to make my opinion here. I, I haven't used Facebook and Instagram in such a long time. I mean, I have them, but like the only social media I really use is Twitter uh, for obvious reasons. But I think. Like they still have a lot of users, right? Like, uh, and in Instagram especially definitely has a lot of people who would be interested in something like this. I don't know about Facebook, like NFTs on Facebook. Eh, I mean, I think it's worth more on Instagram, obviously, because Instagram is much more catered towards the media side of things rather than uh, Facebook, which is, I don't know what Facebook is catered towards these days. As I said, I haven't been on in a while. Seems very disjointed, but still cool to to see these go live uh, on on Polygon today. So speaking of layer twos, uh, Miria or Myria here, someone's going to make fun of me for my bad pronunciation again, has partnered with Starkware to create a ZK Starks based Ethereum layer two scaling solution, which powers uh, their gaming platform, marketplace and wallet. So I think this is the first instance of another company using Starkware's technology uh, to build a layer two scaling solution other than DYDX. Like obviously there is DYDX, but they've I don't know, they haven't abandoned Starkware, but they've obviously announced plans to do their app chain. But I think this is the, the first uh, uh, um, first one outside of DYDX, unless I'm misremembering. I don't believe anyone else is using uh, Starkware's um, uh, roll-ups. I, I, I think this is a roll-up, right? Because obviously uh, there are other things using Starkware, such as Diversify and Immutable X, but they are Validium. So I, b I believe this is a, a roll-up. Uh, let me have a look here. I actually only saw this just before. And they're saying Layer 2 protocol, but like people have been using Layer 2 to refer to uh, Validiums and... Um, 
uh, and other kind of like such constructions instead of a roll up. Actually, no, I think this is a Validium or because they're saying up to 9,000 transactions per second, which is what Immutable X talks about as well. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely don't think this is a kind of like a roll up here. If I, if I kind of like Google roll up, no, uh, Validium. No, I don't doubt they're going to talk about the technology. It's, it de definitely seems to be a Validium, but I'll, um, I'll kind of like dig deeper in that off, offline. Because uh, I can't see anything that immediately jumps out here, but this is an NFT platform, so I would expect it to probably uh, have to go on a Validium because a zk roll would be too expensive for an NFT platform. Regardless of all of that, still very cool to see another layer two, uh, or I guess like another. See, I struggle here because. <laughs> Depending on who you talk to, you'll get torched for calling a Validium, something that stores its data off-chain, a Layer 2. But I feel like the Layer 2 term, like, I don't know, guys. Like, I, I don't know if we're going to win that battle. Like, I, I want to be technically accurate when I describe things. But <clears throat> I'm seeing, you know, respected people and respected uh, companies referring to, like, Validiums as a Layer 2. And I'm kind of like, okay, well... Is the layer two term just re referencing, it can reference something that stores its data on chain and off chain. And then we just call the th something that kind of like stores both its data and its um, transaction proofs on chain a roll up. And like, do we differentiate like that? I, I don't know. Like, I don't know. But it's still very cool to see the the more Validiums launching. Like, I, I think they're, they're fine products. Uh, but yeah, that, that terminology always gets me tripped up. Like, I, I just don't, I, I try not to like annoy anyone when I talk about these sorts of things. Because as I said, depending on who you talk to, you'll get torched for referring to things in the wrong way. But I think that uh, the terminology wars are the hardest ones to win. It's just whatever people refer to it as. I mean, at the end of the day, we retired uh, the ETH2 terminology months ago, but everyone still uses it. Like even some of the, a lot of the ETH core devs and researchers will still say ETH2 because it's just that catch-all term that has been around for a long time. And fighting terminology is very, very hard. Uh, I know from experience, it's very, very hard. As an educator, as trying to be as technically accurate as possible, doesn't matter at the end of the day. It, what matters is what people refer to it as. In saying that, I don't think we should allow things that are like completely separate to Ethereum to call themselves layer twos. Like we shouldn't call other layer ones layer twos to Ethereum um, because they don't, they, they really have nothing to do with Ethereum, right? Whereas I can... I can accept bending the rules for a Validium or, or, or like an Arbitrum Nova, for example, something that does not store its data on Ethereum. Uh, but I still think rollups are going to be the long-term winner anyway with things like dank sharding. So yeah, anyway, go check this out. I'll link it in the YouTube description if you want to read all about what Maria is here. All right, so Vault's uh, protocol has put fixed borrowing live uh, today. So essentially, uh, the launch of fixed borrowing uh, means traders can convert variable variable borrowing positions on Aave and Compound into fixed borrowing positions. So this can be done within a few clicks on the Vault's UI here. So if you do have an Aave or Compound position and it's variable on a variable rate, you can change it to fixed rate with Vault's protocol here. So the initial pools... We'll cover Aave USDC, Aave ETH, Compound USDT borrowing positions, providing opportunity to lock in fixed stablecoin borrowing or fixed ETH borrowing costs in the build-up to the merge. So if you, as I said, if you have those positions open, you can definitely go check out this uh, ability or this feature on Vault's protocol. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, so uh, Feet announced today that they are live on the Polygon Mumbai testnet. So I want to disclose here that I'm an angel investor in Fee. Uh, I think I've talked about them once before on the refuel, uh, but I wanted to highlight that they're live on testnet because they've been working hard for a few months now. So they describe themselves as the Web3 world uh, created directly from ENS domains and wallet activity activities, enabling the easy visualization of, of on-chain identities. So the reason why I found this protocol like, very interesting is because I am really bullish on on-chain identity. I think that obviously there are things to be worked out such as privacy and usability, but I think that in general, you your on-chain identity, your on-chain profile, you know, for example, my sasl.eth is me, is my reputation, is part of me, and is something that I'm going to use across all Web3 stuff for the you know foreseeable future. So I, want, I would love a way to visualize that. I would love a way to get more creative with it, to get more interactive with it. And that's what Fee is doing here by allowing people to visualize their on-chain identity and build potentially cities, Web3 cities from your kind of wallet activities here. So as I said, they're launched on the Polygon Mumbai testnet today, which you can go check out. You can basically open the app here. I don't know if it's going to work for me because uh, I'd have to connect my wallet, which uh, am I on uh, my sasl.eth wallet? I'll probably do it live on air for you guys. I haven't done this yet. Uh, let's connect my wallet here. 
uh, Sassel thought ETH. Uh, let's see. What, it's going to tell me to change networks. <laughs> yeah, switch a network to uh, the Mumbai test net. Okay. Now let's see. ANF's not found. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's probably because uh, it's it's on, uh, yeah, on, on Girly. Okay. It's uh, de definitely not going to work, unfortunately, live on air here. But you can go test this out for yourself uh, and port everything over. I'll definitely do this off air. Um, but yeah, if you want to learn about what fee is, you can check out their website as well. It's got a bit more information here, as well as uh, uh, links to joining the community uh, and, and partnerships and reading their blog and everything like that. So definitely go check that out if you haven't yet. And you can actually see the graphics here of what this could potentially look like based on your on-chain activity, right? You could have like a whale if you were a, if you were a whale, right? Or you could have like a Uniswap um a little uh, uh, Uniswap signage there if you use Uniswap. And I mean, you can think about like, I, these are just the very simplistic things, but you can think about how far you can take this and how you can have very unique things depending on what you've done. Like for example, were you a Genesis validator? Was your validator spun up at Beacon Chain Genesis? That could be really cool. Were you a Genesis, uh, were, were you a receiver of ETH at the Ethereum um, Genesis? Like that would be very rare, right? And then you can kind of like expand this out and you could create like a whole metaverse here where you visit other people's cities, you do things in them, you can uh, extend it out to to building applications within it. Like it's all this, this is really definitely part of the metaverse, but the possibilities can potentially be endless here. So that's why uh, I kind of like back them. I'm excited about it. I don't back many of these sorts of things like NFT projects. Uh, I, I generally steer clear of them because a lot of them are definitely scams and a lot of them are definitely grifts and a lot of them just make no sense. But I do think fee makes sense and I do think it's something that people should be excited about. So definitely go check it out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. All right, last up here, I just wanted to give a shout out to this amazing podcast that Justin Drake has done with uh, Bankless all about Ethereum censorship resistance and censorship in general. Honestly, like I wish I was as smart as Justin. I wish I could distill these things down, uh, these concepts down as well as Justin does. I highly, highly, highly recommend you go listen to this podcast. It's about a couple of hours. It covers so many things that I've talked about on the refuel, but just in more depth and with more technical clarity than I can give, obviously because Justin works full-time as an Ethereum researcher. Uh, but yeah, I just a hundred percent go listen to it. Go do it after you finish listening to this. I think this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. So go do it as soon as I finish the refuel here. Uh, and on top of that, you can actually look at um, his slides, I believe he yeah, he, he's got a bunch of slides that he um, presented at EdCon about this as well, which you can find in the replies to uh, to this tweet here. Um, and uh, yeah, just definitely go kind of like check it out. Go give it a listen. Highly recommend it. I learned uh, you know, a fair bit myself, but it's not just about learning it. It's about reinforcing uh, the concepts in my head as well. Like the way I'm able to distill things down and why I'm able to cover such a wide breadth of things on the refuel is because I'm exposed to it multiple times a day. Like, all the merge related stuff that is in my head, I have literally been exposed to it every day for like years now. It's just years worth of built up knowledge that has worked for me. I don't know what kind of learner you are, but you know, even if you know something, even if you're aware of something, even if you've heard it, heard it a hundred times, I still think it's worth listening and, and hearing it again, potentially from different perspectives, potentially in different kind of technical clarity and different terms. And that's exactly what uh, Justin Drake has done here about the censorship resistance and censorship in general on Ethereum. And it honestly made me bullish on the future of Ethereum censorship resistance because we have so many solutions coming to help and uh, with, with kind of like obviously the OFAC stuff and any other censorship potential that comes to the network, especially under proof of stake. So go give it a listen. I'll link it in the YouTube description below, but I think that's going to be it for today. Thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, uh, uh, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all on Thursday. Yeah, not, not tomorrow on Thursday. Uh, thanks everyone.